the important thing is, is to create that time, right? Like everyone has the same amount of time. Everyone has 24 hours in a day. It's really how we choose to spend that time. So if we can choose to spend our time and we can choose our own thoughts, then if we think that our relationship is important, then it's important for us to carve out that time in our day, in our week. Assalamu alaikum, Sadaf. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, walaikum assalam. Thank you for having me, Javair. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and what we're talking about today? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a board certified OBGYN and intimacy coach, and I've been practicing obstetrics and gynecology as an attending for over 19 years now. And um, I'm also a certified um intimacy coach. So basically a life coach that focuses on int- intimacy and relationships and sex. And um, I basically help women to remove mental and physical barriers so that they can achieve pleasure in their relationships. So we have so many cultural and religious taboos, and I'm sure you're aware of it. We're both Muslim and we are both talking about sex coaching here. So how do you navigate them while providing guidance to your clients? How do you help them overcome the additional blocks that are there in addition to, you know? Yeah, that's a great question, Drea. And, you know, what I would say is that it all starts with understanding not only yourself, but also your religion. So in Islam, is you know, it's funny because... We don't know it because we don't talk about it. And, you know, I think perhaps uh, maybe like the Arab Muslims are a little bit probably more open than we are as Desis, but it's understanding that Islam is a very sex positive religion. And unless you learn that, you think that because the culture that we grow up in is very, you know, they think everyone thinks that sex is very taboo and they think it's wrong, dirty, shameful, and you don't talk about those things. And so when you realize that Islam is a very sex positive religion, then I think you give yourself permission. So when when you are able to give yourself permission to find out about sex and find out what Islam says about sex, and then realize that in Islam, we actually have female sexual rights, which I never knew about growing up or even when I got married, um, but that there is. And so, you know, I mean, what other religion do you know of? And I don't know of any religion. And I'm not saying that I'm a scholar in religion by any means. So I could totally be off. But I don't know of any religion offhand that gives sexual rights to women. And I think that that is, and think about it, you know, that's in Islam and that's coming like over 1400 years ago. Think how progressive Islam was at that time um, to give women female sexual rights. You know, Allah gave them to us and the prophet peace be upon him talks about it as well. So, you know, I think that really understanding our religion and realizing that, you know, we are allowed to have pleasure in our relationships. We are allowed to, you know, ask for a foreplay and things like that. And our pleasure is to be prioritized. I mean, there's a hadith of the prophet, peace be upon him, that says, you know, a man should not um, complete himself, basically, you know, talking about orgasm and satisfy himself without satisfying his wife first. And it's, you know, that's, I'm paraphrasing. So don't quote me. I, you know, I don't want your listeners to be like, ah, she said it totally wrong. But the point is, is that, you know, female sexual pleasure is taken very seriously and men are encouraged to please their women, to please their wives and wife. And, and that is very important. And actually women in Islam are able to divorce their spouses if they are not sexually satisfied. So all of those things to me, says like, wow, you know, I didn't even realize that Islam had all of these sexual rights given to women. And so when we realize that, it really should be empowering. So what motivated you to delve into this field of uh, intimacy coaching, given all the cultural context and um, religious context, and the fact that there was going to be some uh, criticism as well? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, you know, what happened is that I wanted to be a resource that I never had. And, you know, growing up in a conservative community, I figured that, you know, we definitely didn't learn anything about this. And I think that most women don't. And to be honest, I don't think it really matters that we're Muslim. I think that a lot of women, I have a lot of clients that come to me that are, you know, Catholic, Christian, that are brought up very strict. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that have similar ideas of what sexual health is, what sexuality is, and that, you know, they feel the same. They were, you know, they were raised, they, they were taught that, you know, sex is wrong, dirty, shameful. And, and then, so they have similar um, sex negativity. And so I think that, you know, having, had that. And then as you grow up, you realize that there's such a need for it. And especially, you know, I think you and I talked about this last time uh, offline is that you know, in medical school, we don't learn about this stuff, right? Like nobody talks about sexual health. I know that in my medical school, which was here in the States, um, we did not learn about sexual health. We learned maybe a few hours on the sexual response cycle. And that was it. And then in residency, and you think about it, you know, I'm obstetrics and gynecology. We did not learn anything at all about sexual health, nothing. I mean, four years, you know, I mean, granted, you know, and OB, as you know, is a very intense residency. So we're focused on babies. We're focused on, you know, reproduction. We're focused on infertility. We're focused on all these different aspects of a woman's health, but we don't talk about menopause. We don't talk about perimenopause and we don't talk about sexual health. So, you know, these are like, glaring voids in our residency programs. And so, you know, as I was practicing and I'm still practicing as an OBGYN, um, I realized that there was this huge gap in our curriculum and I wanted to be able to fill it. And so I learned to fill it on my own. I took a year long course through the University of Michigan um, online that was on sexual counseling and education. And then I became a coach through Rutgers University. And so that's really what motivated me is that I wanted to be the resource I never had. Yeah. And I really want to applaud you for that because it's, I know how lonely it is when you start um, and you are looking for resources for yourself and you don't find them anywhere. And I remember talking to one of my mentors and I said, there's there's nothing out there for women like myself. I don't I don't see those resources that I need right now. And she said, well, you're going to have to create them. So good for you for doing that. Yeah. Um, because I understand how hard it is. Yeah. How do you how do you see a strong connection between sexual health and the whole well-being of the Muslim family unit? Or any family unit? Let's Yeah. See. Yeah. So, you know, I think that well, sexual health is very, very important. And you know what? I think what we have to understand is that sexual health is part of health, right? Sexual health prevents people from um, letting sexually transmitted infections take over their lives. You know, they're able to go and ask for help. It prevents intimate partner violence. It prevents unplanned pregnancy. So um, it prevents all of those things. And I think that what also is important to understand is that, you know, sexual health is also about pleasure. And that's something that, you know, people don't talk about at all. And so I think that understanding and embracing all of those things leads to a more complete life. And I think that um, having that part of your life be fulfilled, really, I think leads to a more richer community and also to a richer family life. And I think that that's really what's important. Sex education is all about, you know, being more inclusive and, and in schools, you know, the thing is, is that with the schools, most schools don't have a standardized curriculum. So here in the U.S., all the states get money for sex education, but how they spend it and if they spend it is up to them. And it's really based on the district. And so for people that have children in school, it really is important to figure out what your children are learning in school because different states have different recommendations and criteria. So for example, let's say like a Southern state, they may not teach anything about contraception. In fact, they may only teach about abstinence, right? So Whereas a different state teaches about contraception, they take they teach about safe sex, they teach about infections. So it's really important for the parent to understand what their school is teaching them so that you can really fill in the gaps for your children. And that, you know, we know that children here have access to way more information than we ever did growing up. And so it's silly for us to think that our children don't know anything. They probably know way more than we do. And so it's important though, to understand and realize where are they getting their information from, right? Is it through school? Is it through friends? Is it Googling? Is it even porn? So 
we have to really be aware and have those open conversations with our families and our children so that they know that we are a safe place for them to come to if they have questions. And we have to it's important for us not to shame them, right? Because I think that, you know, shame, guilt, embarrassment, all of those things are negative emotions. And if we start to have those negative emotions, we're definitely not going to come back to that person that elicited that feeling in us. So it's really important for us to have our children understand that they can come to us and they can ask us and that we won't shame them and that we are a resource for them when they need it and if they have questions. And I'm going to throw this out there too, because there are some of my clients who have children who belong to the LGBTQ community and they don't really know how to talk to their children. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that, you know, each case is very specific, right? So you have to see what works for you. I think that when people talk to their patients or their clients and, um, and when parents talk to their children, they have to really talk to them in an age appropriate manner where the children will understand what's going on. I think that, you know, you can't, I think it's too much to throw, you know, a lot of information at kids and expect them to understand. I think you have to really go slow and see, you know, what level they're at and what level they're able to understand what's going on and then go based on that. Um, what advice do you give couples uh, who struggle with communication and intimacy within their marriage? Definitely. So, you know, that's actually one of the biggest things and one of the biggest reasons why couples divorce, right? We know that um, there is something called the Female Sexual Satisfaction Survey. And um, when researchers asked women what caused them to be most sexually satisfied, the one factor that they all stated was communication. So we know that communication is so super important. We know that when we don't have it, things fall apart. Um, and so what I feel that a lot of couples can do is they, you know, reach out to their friends and their family, but also creating that intimacy within your own self, within your relationship. So there are lots of things that you could do. You could, you know, and they don't cost a lot of money. What intimacy is, is really about connecting with the other individual and creating out time for them. So if you're watching a movie together or sitting on a couch together, right? Cuddling, hugging, kissing, right? All of those things can happen and that doesn't cost anything. You can go out for a walk. You can hold hands. You can create a meal together, right? All of those things create emotional intimacy, something that most women crave and which eventually then leads to physical intimacy. You have intellectual intimacy, you have experiential intimacy, right? Doing things together that may be novel to both of you and, you know, creates that special bond with each other. I think also when couples are really struggling for intimacy within each other is being vulnerable with each other, right? Telling each other what your thoughts and feelings are, what your desires are, what you really want. And I think that those, you know, they sound like they're super easy to do, but I would guess that most individuals don't do them. You know, they'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm too tired or I'm too busy or, you know, there's just so much going on. But the important thing is, is to create that time, right? Like everyone has the same amount of time. Everyone has 24 hours in a day. It's really how we choose to spend that time. So if we can choose to spend our time and we can choose our own thoughts, then if we think that our relationship relationship is important, then it's important for us to carve out that time in our day, in our week, right? It can start with a, something as simple as maybe 15 minutes at the end of your day, you know, checking in with each other, and asking how they're doing, you know, what they want, what they don't want, what they like, what they don't like, and really finding a time when you're not busy doing something else, right? So it's hard to have a conversation that's deep and meaningful with somebody when you're worried about, you know, the laundry or the dinner being made or, you know, picking up the kids or something like that in the middle of your day, it's not going to happen. You're not going to find that emotional connection. So it's really about creating time and finding time to have those deep, conversations where, you know, you'd say that, like, what is on the table for us to talk about, right? It can be just intimacy, not, you know, we're not going to talk about finances, we're not going to talk about our children, right? That's what a lot of couples end up doing when they have time together, all they do is talk about their kids. <laughs> so it's as if the kids were there. Um, so really just focusing on each other. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. 
Now you are a medical doctor, you're a gynecologist. How do you differentiate issues that can be addressed via coaching versus um, the ones that really need medical attention? And how do you go about handling that situation? Yeah, so, you know, differentiating between what can be addressed medically and what is coaching is, I think, takes a lot of experience and knowledge. And I think what's important to know is, you know, really figuring out why the client is there, right? What are their goals? What is it that they're trying to achieve in that one hour that you have for that one-on-one coaching? And, you know, the client will tell you, like I recently had a woman that had vaginismus. So for um, if you're your listeners that may not know what vaginismus is, it's the involuntary contractions of muscles surrounding the vagina that is that happens in anticipation of fear due to penetration, right? So when this woman came to me, I had to figure out one, was she having pain? Was she having this fear of pain of penetration due to say um, something anatomically going on in the vulva region, right? Is she having vaginal dryness? I had to look at her age. I had to look at what was causing this vaginismus that she was experiencing. What were um, the external factors? So that's a lot of times what I do in terms of trying to figure out if it's medical in origin. Mm-hmm. Then, um, if I know that she's been, say, that she's had a recent uh, medical exam already, and somebody has examined her, because my my consultations are virtual, so I wouldn't be able to examine her, and she'd have to be in the same state for me to see her as a physician, uh, to have a doctor patient relationship. So, anyways, what I had to do was figure out, you know, what was causing that uh, vaginismus. So we went through the anatomical reasons. You know, is it that she's postmenopausal and she's experiencing vaginal dryness? Is it that she has a little bit of of atrophy, right, um, of the vagina because she's postmenopausal? Is it that um, she has something else going on in her vulva region? Maybe she has an infection, something like that. So, you know, those are things that you have to kind of sift through. And then after that, if everything comes out negative, then you work through the psychological or the cognitive um part of it. So which is, you know, what are her thoughts surrounding sex? Well, how she how does she see sex? Does she have a negative um, belief about sex? You know, so for this specific individual that I'm thinking of, uh, what she and I discovered was that she was a devout Christian. And she really believed that uh, for her, um, sex out of marriage was wrong. And so when she became, and she had been divorced for a long time. So now she was in a new relationship and she wanted to, you know, figure out why she was having this vaginismus. And then when we realized that it was her feelings and, you know, then we went and we talked a little bit about her feelings and she felt like, you know, having, um, extramarital, you know, intercourse or having sex outside of marriage uh, was wrong, that it was, you know, something that she should not be doing. Then we, we realized that, you know, for her, that could have been the cause of her vaginismus, that she was um, in that when she tried to have be physically intimate with her partner, she would have those thoughts that, you know, this was wrong, she shouldn't be doing it. And then automatically, you know, those muscles would tense up. So for her, that was a big aha moment because she realized she didn't realize before that her thoughts and her feelings about sex and what she was doing um, was impacting the way that her body was reacting. So that was kind of how we worked through both the medical aspect of what was going on with her and also the coaching part of it. So for her, you know, then we worked through what her values were and what she needed and what was important to her. And she realized that for her, it was important and she was getting married anyways. Um, But for her, she realized that when she was previously married, um, she didn't have issues with vaginismus. So she realized that it was only now that she was having this um, issue with vaginismus, but it was that she wasn't married yet to this individual. So she said she's getting married in February and, you know, she would think that perhaps she wouldn't have those issues, but also, you know, it wasn't just the coaching, right? Because the coaching, of course, you and I both know that coaching is all about moving forward in somebody's life and what's holding them back and how they can move through it. But also for her to see a public floor therapist that would work with her with dilators. So for vaginismus, it's always a two-pronged approach. It's the physical component of it, of working with dilators and things like that, but also the psychological component. 
And so that's how, you know, we got her to where she would eventually be able to have um, intercourse with penetration. Yeah. So I know so that we can go on about this topic all day because you are, um, mashallah, so knowledgeable. You're an OBGYN. You are a specialist in the field. But is there something that you really want to touch on um, before we end the conversation? Yeah, what I want people to know is that, you know, for your listeners, I want them to understand that, you know, sexual health is a natural part of life. It is part of health and then to um, to give themselves permission right, to allow themselves to experience pleasure, because there's nothing wrong with that. And that it's no, you're not being selfish, it's not wrong. And that, um, you know, to really move forward, if that's something what somebody wants to do is to really explore their thoughts and see how, you know, those thoughts are causing feelings, and those feelings result in our actions, and to see where we can help with those thoughts so that they can move forward in their relationships. And how do people contact you? Sada? Yeah, so uh, for anyone that is interested, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Sadaf OBGYN. You can email me at Dr. Sadaf at Dr. Sadaf .com. Um, I have a website called Dr. Sadaf .com, which um, focuses on intimacy coaching and telehealth, uh, GYN telehealth for women um, in the states of New York and Michigan. And um, and yeah, I have actually a free webinar coming up. So depending on when this episode is released, I have a webinar coming up on September 13th that is live and it's free. And people can go on my Instagram or TikTok to sign up. And I have a podcast called the Muslim Sex Podcast that people can listen to also to learn more about intimacy and relationships. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sada, for providing invaluable services. And especially thank you for your time today on a Sunday. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on and giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it.